Ragnarok. The coming storm. The end of the gods and the rebirth of humanity. Whichever version of the mythology you look at, Ragnarok exists in some form or another and will bring about the end of the Allfather Odin and his pantheon of Norse gods, the Aesir. In 2021, Sony Santa Monica aimed to release the latest in their long-running God of War saga, which we anticipate to have a tagline with Ragnarok in it. If nothing else, the Stinger trailer has already told us that Ragnarok is coming. This is one of the most anticipated games of the year, with remote working restrictions allowing, of course, and with good reason considering the quality of the previous title. Recently though, one of my friends started playing an older game in the series and didn't know the history behind it. So, for his sake, and for all other fans who have come in since the 2018 soft reboot, let's go over a brief history of God of War. Welcome everybody, my name is Doragon and this is That History. The protagonist in our story is a man called Kratos. He was born to a single mother with a younger brother called Deimos in Sparta, the home of the warriors of ancient Greece. Like many other Spartan boys, both Kratos and Deimos dreamed of being mighty warriors of Sparta once they were old enough, and they would play and train to that end. During one training exercise though, two of the gods of Olympus appeared before the boys, both of them gods of war. One was Ares, the other was Athena. They had been sent by Zeus, the king of the gods, to avert a prophecy. The one marked by the gods will bring about the destruction of Olympus. Zeus misunderstood the prophecy and sent Ares and Athena to take care of Deimos a child of Olympus with a birthmark covering much of his body. During the abduction, Kratos attempts to save his brother and aims to fight Ares. There is no match, being battered aside easily by the god of war, and in the process becomes marked by the gods, with a cut across his eye that would form a scar. Ares aims to kill the young Spartan that would defy him, but Athena steps in, saving Kratos' life and seeming to click on what the prophecy might actually mean. The two gods leave, Deimos in tow, with nothing that Kratos can do to stop them. This is the first time in his life that Kratos feels anger towards the gods of Olympus, a trait that becomes all too familiar throughout his life. On this occasion, however, his mother, who has a few secrets yet to reveal of her own, calms him. And then Kratos, tattooing himself with his brother's birthmark, is able to grow into a man and become a general in the Spartan army. Kratos' rise through the ranks brings him acclaim within Sparta and the wider Greek world. He has glory, riches, but most of all, he has a loving wife and child, a family that he adores. Though his wife is not impressed with his all-encompassing conquest and questions whether his motives are for the glory of Sparta or his own ends. He continues his quest for glory, defeating army after army with infinite ease, until one day the barbarian king stands before him. Kratos' army is outnumbered, and they suffer a catastrophic defeat at the hands of the barbarian army. The barbarian king is about to take Kratos' life when the Spartan calls out to the god of war for aid. Destroy my enemies, and my life is yours. Ares answers, descending upon the battlefield and destroying the barbarian army. Seeing the makings of a god within a man, Ares presents Kratos with two unique weapons called the Blades of Chaos, fused to his skin with the chains a sign of his servitude to his new master, the god of war. 
Kratos' bloodthirsty rampage then accelerates at the behest of Ares, with him sacking not just armies, but towns and cities too with reckless abandon. Until he descends on one fateful town. Kratos' army descends upon the town that worships Athena, which is an affront to Lord Ares. However, in this town, the oracle warns him to turn away. Blinded by his bloodlust, Kratos continues forward and slays everyone bar the oracle. As the blood haze passes, Kratos realizes the truth of what has happened. Ares has orchestrated events to sever all of Kratos' ties to his humanity and complete three blood oaths to seal Kratos to him forever. Spill the blood of his enemies. Spill the blood of innocence. Spill the blood of his own kin. Within the temple that Kratos has turned red with its inhabitants' blood were his wife and daughter, who now lay dead at Kratos' feet, murdered by his own hand. The oracle deemed it worthy that no man should ever forget an atrocity the likes of which Kratos has perpetrated, and taking his family's ashes, used them to turn his skin ghostly white, earning him the nickname, the Ghost of Sparta. At this point, Kratos severed his ties with Ares, going back on his blood oath made on the battlefield with the barbarian king. This incurred the anger of the Furies, creatures created from the battle of the primordials that formed the earth, the guardians of the Oath Keeper, and exactors of justice on those who would break a blood oath, and they began their hunt of the ghost of Sparta. Six months later, Kratos has been experiencing visions, visions that are messing with his perceptions of reality. When a man called Orcos meets Kratos, he explains these are visions of the Furies, designed to trick him and enslave him. This, Orcos knows, as he is the son of the Fury Queen and Ares, and the Oath Keeper, who holds all blood oaths within his body. In a three-week chase, the Furies encounter Kratos multiple times as he gathers relics to help him stave off their visions and ultimately defeat them. He discovers the revelation that Ares has coerced the Furies into no longer acting fairly, and having them bring Kratos back into his servitude to overthrow Zeus and Olympus. The Furies do succeed in capturing Kratos, and they torture him for a time, but he manages to escape and ultimately kill all three Furies and the living prison, Aegean the Hecatonchores, freeing himself from Ares' grasp, or so he thinks. Orcos meets Kratos once more when the Spartan has returned home. He asks for an honorable death as dying will be the only thing to free both Orcos and Kratos of Ares' torment. After much deliberation, Kratos grants his wish and realizes his path to redemption is now in the servitude of the gods. Kratos spends the next ten years in servitude to the gods. Most actions are small and inconsequential, slowly working his way towards forgiveness. But two stand out as large and impactful in this time period. And the first started with the Persian attack of Attica. Kratos was tasked by the gods to save Attica from the Persian invasion. This he manages to do with relative ease, even taking out a basilisk in the Persian general. But as Kratos claims victory and asks the gods if that is all they would have him do, Helios, and therefore the sun, fall from the sky. The world is plunged into darkness, and the gods are plunged into a deep sleep. With no contact or guidance from those that he currently serves, and with humanity at the whim of underworld creatures in the infinite darkness, Kratos sets off to discover what has happened and put the sun back in the sky. The falling sun is an act of Morpheus, the god of sleep and dreams, but it is masterminded by the Titan Atlas and the goddess Persephone. Kratos pursues Persephone and eventually finds himself at the gates of Elysium. The fields of Elysium beyond 
being the home of pure and innocent souls after death. This is where Kratos' daughter's soul resides. Persephone offers him passage to the fields to be reunited with Calliope, and Kratos, without a second thought, takes her offer, draining his power and meeting his daughter once more in a joyous scene. At this moment, Atlas attacks the pillar holding up the world, using the fallen sun god Helios' powers. The plan is to destroy the pillar, the world above, and all afterlives. Kratos is forced to forsake his daughter once more to save her, and becomes the monster once again to take on and defeat both Persephone and Atlas, killing the former and trapping the latter to hold the world forevermore upon his shoulders. Both foes offer words of warning that Kratos will come to regret his actions in helping the gods. Kratos ignores them and rides the sun chariot back into its rightful place in the sky and then falls to the earth unconscious. The gods save Kratos from the fall, but strip him of the weapons and magics he has learned upon the way, putting him then back to work before their next big request. Ten years after the murder of his family and his torture at the hands of the Furies, after defeating a Hydra at the behest of Poseidon, and to save his own skin, Kratos confronts Athena while sailing the Aegean Sea. Ten years, Athena! I have faithfully served the gods for ten years. When will you relieve me of these nightmares? The gods ask one final thing of Kratos to be forgiven for all of his sins. Kill the god of war, Ares, who is trying to overthrow Zeus and Olympus. Kratos first sails to Athens, where Aphrodite and Zeus both grant him magical powers to assist in his journey, atop the ones granted by Poseidon earlier in his trip. He encounters the Oracle of Athens, who after accessing Kratos' memories and questioning why he is the chosen saviour of Athens, puts him on the journey to find, obtain and open Pandora's box. The journey takes Kratos through many different locations until he encounters the last living titan, Zeus's father, Kronos. Punished by his son for eating all of his children, Kronos wanders the desert on his hands and knees with the Temple of Pandora upon his back. Kratos enters the temple and obtains the box. However, before he is able to open it, Ares launches a stone pillar at Kratos from Athens and pierces the ghost of Sparta, sending him to Hades. Fighting his way back to the surface without entering the river Styx, Kratos emerges once more in Athens and goes to tackle Ares. He opens Pandora's box and obtains the power to kill a god. The battle is fierce and on more than one occasion Kratos appears defeated. Ares plays with Kratos' mind and throws him into a dream state where he cannot save his family over and over again while Ares deals the killing blow. Except, Kratos saves them. He saves them, breaks the dream state, and takes up a new weapon, finally bringing Ares to his knees. That night, I was trying to make you a great warrior. You succeeded. Kratos kills Ares, saving what is left of Athens. He speaks to Athena to rid him of the nightmares that have plagued him, but the gods made sure to choose their words carefully ten years earlier. Athena, rid me of the memories that haunt me still. You have done well, Kratos. Though we mourn the death of our brother, the gods are indebted to you. We promised your sins would be forgiven, and so they are but we never promised to take away your nightmares. No man, no god could ever forget the terrible deeds you have done. Kratos, distraught, takes himself to the top of Suicide Bluffs and in his sorrow, hurls himself to his death. The gods of Olympus have abandoned me. Now there is no hope. 
And Kratos cast himself from the highest mountain in all of Greece. After ten years of suffering, ten years of endless nightmares, it would finally come to an end. Death would be his escape from madness. The gods have other ideas, however, and lift Kratos from the watery demise he chose for himself and bring him to Mount Olympus. For there is now an empty throne among the gods, and as a reward for his services, it is offered to Kratos as the new god of war. Kratos struggles to relinquish his mortal life, and as the god of war leads the Spartan army on a rampage across Greece, relishing in his newfound power. The other gods of Olympus try to halt the rampage, with Hera's giant pet Argos leading an army of beasts to stop him. After multiple skirmishes, Argos is killed, though not by Kratos. The evidence, however, paints a different picture, one that would turn the Olympians against Kratos fully, as it looks like he is the killer. In a bid to clear his name, Kratos hunts the anonymous assassin across Greece, hindered at every turn by creatures of the underworld and leaving destruction in his wake. Zeus sends a message to Kratos via Serex, son of the messenger god Hermes. Stop the relentless pursuit and take heed of the destruction already caused. Kratos, however, ignores the message, engages in combat with Serex and kills him. The assassin escapes and Kratos realizes that his actions have further alienated himself from the other gods of Olympus. Kratos sits now on the throne of Olympus as the new god of war, but still haunted by the nightmares of his past. Those nightmares have shifted though, and now he is haunted by his childhood and the loss of his brother. The nightmares shift and become visions, Visions of his mother calling for help, calling him to the temple of Poseidon, deep in Atlantis, Poseidon's favoured city. Athena warns Kratos against digging into his past, as there is more to the situation than he knows. But Kratos knows he can change the visions and save his mother, so presses onward. On the way to Atlantis, Poseidon himself steps in and sends his monstrous sealer to stop him. Kratos, armed with the chained blades of Athena following his ascent to godhood, battles with the monster on multiple occasions, eventually killing it. Kratos makes his way to the temple in Atlantis, where as the vision suggested, he found his mother in a weakened state, alone on a bed. Callisto reveals to her son that Deimos is alive, though captured and tortured in death's domain by Thanatos, the god of death. Kratos asks why she has not sent him to save his brother sooner, where she reveals his father swore her to secrecy. Before Callisto can reveal the identity of his father, she is transformed into a monster with hyper strength and killing intent. With no option but to fight back, Kratos kills the monstrous version of his mother and she returns to her natural form, thanking her son for freeing her and pleading with him to save his brother. Kratos' rage is palpable once again. Kratos pushes forward and finds himself face to face with the titan Thera, who is imprisoned within the mountain of Atlantis and its main power source. He takes Thera's offer of power and frees her. Between this and his battle with Scylla, Atlantis' foundations had been shattered and Atlantis sank into the sea. Kratos turned his rage towards the gods once more following their lies about Deimos' faith. Athena! You lied to me! The gods lied to me! My brother lives. He lives! Athena! Don't let your rage blind you, Kratos. There is much you do not know. Be warned. 
They will all try to stop. Settling into his quest, Kratos travels to Sparta to regain his Spartan arms. Erinus, Thanatos' daughter, attempts to stop Kratos on the way, to no avail, losing her life to the god of war. Once he has regained his arms, he travels into Death's Domain to take on Thanatos and free his brother, though the latter is not a happy reunion. Deimos blames Kratos for leaving him for nearly 30 years and not seeking to free him. Once freed, Deimos proceeds to attack his brother. Kratos, already having lost his mother, wife and child, refuses to fight his only remaining family. As Deimos continues to attack, Thanatos intervenes, taking Deimos to the same suicide bluffs that Kratos threw himself off not so long ago, and he tries to throw Deimos to his death. Kratos saves his brother, who finally relents. Thanatos remarks that Zeus chose poorly, and that Kratos is actually the marked warrior before fighting the two brothers. In the skirmish, Thanatos transforms and kills Deimos. Enraged more than ever before in his life, Kratos turns all his rage on Thanatos and destroys him. Kratos carries his brother to the top of the mountain, where the grave digger, who allowed Kratos to escape Hades in his quest to kill Ares, has a grave already dug for Deimos. Kratos once more contemplates suicide and asks the world a question. By the gods, what have I become? Death, the destroyer of worlds. It is done. You have let go of that which made you mortal. Your ties to this world are severed. You are ready to be a god. Is this all a game to you, Athena? It is not over. The gods will pay for this. Forgive me, brother. Unbeknownst to Kratos, the gravedigger has one more job to do. Now? Only one remains. Sat upon the throne of the God of War, Kratos is now completely alone amongst the gods. Athena keeps trying to form a connection to her brother, but with Kratos not being aware of his heritage, it is to no avail. The God of War has commanded his Spartan army to conquer many cities of Greece, specifically targeting cities loyal to the other gods, and he overlooks all of their conquests jumping into each fight towards its conclusion to assert his dominance. Coupled with his actions since opening Pandora's box, this causes many of the gods to fear Kratos, and they step in to prevent his continuing conquest in Rhodes. Shrunk back down to the size of a mortal, but still with the strength and skills of a god, Kratos rips through Rhodes and the newly animated Colossus. After one skirmish with said Colossus, Zeus opens the heavens to lend Kratos aid and offers him the Blade of Olympus, the weapon that ended the Titan War. Kratos takes the offer and pours all of his godly power into the blade, using it to defeat the Colossus once and for all. Mortal, due to his powers being transferred to the weapon, Kratos takes mighty damage from the fallen Colossus and loses the blade, at which point Zeus enters the battlefield, taking up the weapon and stating that he must protect Olympus. Zeus kills Kratos. It did not have to be this way, my son. This path is of your choosing. A choice 
from the gods is as useless as the gods themselves. Even now, as you draw your last breath, you continue to defy me! Everything you have ever known, Kratos, will now suffer because of your sacrilege. You will never be the ruler of Olympus. The cycle ends here. Gripped by the hands of death on his way to Hades, Kratos is spoken to by the narrator of his story, Gaia, the Mother Earth Titan. She instructs Kratos to fight his way out, search out the sisters of fate and change his past to not die at the hands of Zeus. Using a Pegasus, Kratos travels to the island of creation, encountering the titans Typhon and Prometheus on the way and gaining new abilities. Kratos encounters Theseus upon arriving at the island of time and must defeat him to move forward into the island itself. This he does easily. Many seek the sisters of fate to change their own demise and Kratos encounters the barbarian king once again on the island. For a second time, Kratos defeats him and severs his head from his body. He also encounters the Gorgon Uriel, Perseus and Icarus, and in their own madness for their own quests, all are battled and killed, granting new abilities and weapons to Kratos on his journey. After defeating a Kraken and entering the Palace of the Fates, Kratos fights an unseen foe and mortally wounds them. This foe turns out to be one of Kratos' most loyal soldiers who has served him faithfully since his initial ascension to godhood. He informs Kratos that Zeus has destroyed Sparta and all who live there despite the now ex and dead god of war, Kratos. This is why he, the last Spartan, was on the island. The loyal soldier dies in Kratos' arms and the monster of rage rises once again. Kratos challenges Zeus there and then, but gets no rise or answer, so continues forward. He reaches the Sisters of Fate and makes his request to change the outcome of his battle with Zeus, but they refuse, so battle ensues. The battle takes place across time with the Sisters trying to alter pivotal moments in Kratos' past. The Ghost of Sparta kills the initial two, and then their own sister back at the Palace of the Fates using her own traps against her. Kratos is now in possession of the Loom of Fate, and uses it to travel back in time to the moment of his death. Even now, as you draw your last breath, you continue to defy me, no matter. What? How can this be? The Sisters of Fate have aided you. Unexpected. The sisters are dead. Zeus and Kratos battle atop a mountain above Rhodes, and after much back and forth, Kratos wins. As he aims to deliver the killing blow, Athena dives in front of the blade, taking the blow and letting Zeus escape. Dying in Kratos' arms, Athena tells him that no son should ever kill their father, finally revealing Kratos' heritage to him, only wounding him further as he has now killed two siblings in Ares and Athena, and his own father has killed him. Somehow, this makes him even angrier at the gods of Olympus. Kratos uses the Loom of Fate once more and travels back to the Great Titan War, calling all Titans through to the present day to destroy Olympus once and for all. The Titans and Kratos mount a direct attack upon Olympus, and the gods respond quickly and in kind. Many Titans are ripped from the mountain and fall, either to begin their climb again, or to their demise. Poseidon accounts for at least three, and then sets his sights upon his fourth and fifth victims, Gaia and Kratos who rides the Mother Earth Titan up the mountain. Unlike her fellow Titans, Gaia manages to remain upon the mountain, but is hounded and attacked by Poseidon consistently. 
Kratos wastes no time in entering the battle against the god of the seas and fights Poseidon into submission before beating him further and finally killing him. Rejoining Gaia, the two finish their ascent and Kratos greets Zeus once more. can no longer hide behind the skirts of Athena. Athena is dead because of the rage that consumes you, Kratos. What more will you destroy? The hands of death could not defeat me. The sisters of fate could not hold me. And you will not see the end of this day. I will have my revenge! Petulant child, I will tolerate your insolence no more! Zeus attacks both Gaia and Kratos with his full might, severely damaging Gaia's hand and throwing both from the summit of Olympus. The two try to recover, but Gaia lets slip that she saved Kratos to serve the Titans and owes him nothing, letting him fall to his death. Kratos enters Hades yet again and proclaims that the gates of Hades have never held him, at which point Athena arrives, having taken on a higher level of existence. She aims to aid Kratos in killing Zeus, even after sacrificing herself to save him not two hours earlier in this timeline. Kratos must obtain the flame of Olympus to defeat Zeus, but first, he needs to escape Hades. This he does by finding and defeating Hades himself, taking the god of the underworld's life and absorbing his soul so that he can use the Hyperion gates. Before using a gate to leave, Kratos once more speaks with Hephaestus, who pleads with the ghost of Sparta to save his daughter. Kratos ignores the pleas and leaves Hades, emerging in the city of Olympus. Here, Kratos encounters Gaia once more, who attempts to coerce Kratos into helping her, as she should be the one to kill Zeus for the Titans. Kratos parrots Gaia's words from earlier back at her and severs her damaged hand, sending her falling to her death. Perseus and Helios battle above the city, and Kratos spies an opportunity. Shooting the sun god out of the sky and letting Perseus crush him before flinging him across the city. Kratos pursues Helios and rips his head from his body following Helios' pleas for mercy. The head is now a glorified torch for Kratos, kept upon his belt. Soon after, flying up the chain of balance, Perseus attempts to take out Kratos in revenge for Gaia. But Kratos turns the tables, slamming the blade of Olympus into the titan's eye and casting him from the mountain with the force of a god, sending yet another titan to their deaths. After reaching the top of the chain, Kratos encounters Hermes, who mocks the ghost of Sparta before running away. Kratos pushes forward and finds the flame of Olympus. Trapped within it is Pandora's box. Athena tells Kratos that the box still holds the power to kill a god but it was resealed, unlike all of the other emotions, locked within said box. Zeus understood that the evils born from that battle, if left free, would destroy the world of man and gods. To contain these evils, Zeus commissioned Hephaestus to build a vessel strong enough to hold them. Fear. Greed. Hate. He locked them all away in the box in hopes that they would never again infect his reign. When you opened the box to kill Ares, you drew from the forbidden powers. After witnessing your victory, fear gripped Zeus. Now in pursuit of Pandora herself, Hermes once again appears to mock an attempt to torment Kratos. The ghost of Sparta chases the messenger god, outsmarting the speedster. Hermes, even in the face of death, continues to mock until Kratos rips both of his legs off, killing the messenger god and granting Kratos the boots of Hermes. Kratos continues forward and encounters Zeus's wife Hera, who seemingly agrees with the ghost of Sparta's quest. 
until he mentions Pandora. Hera commands Kratos' half-brother Hercules to kill him. Hercules, jealous at what he perceives as Zeus's favoritism of Kratos, attacks with the Nemean Cestuses on his fists. Kratos defeats his half-brother, taking the weapons for himself and using them to bludgeon the demigod to death. Continuing forward, Kratos once again encounters Hephaestus, who outlines why he is now deformed thanks to Zeus's fear and that he wishes to protect Pandora. Hephaestus offers to make a weapon for Kratos from the Omphalos Stone, which resides within the belly of Kronos, now trapped in Tartarus following the events with Ares. Kronos blames Kratos for his current situation and aims to kill the ghost of Sparta. Kratos has other ideas though, fighting back, gutting the titan to obtain the stone, rebinding him within his chains, and finally, driving the blade of Olympus into the king of the titan's skull, killing him. Returning to Hephaestus, the smith god makes Kratos a new weapon before trying to take down the ghost of Sparta to protect Pandora. Kratos retaliates and kills the smith god, whose dying words ask him to spare his daughter. Kratos encounters a very, very drunk Hera within her garden. After making it through the garden, Kratos attempts to walk away without harming her. She attacks and mocks, but Kratos doesn't bite, until she speaks ill of Pandora. And with one swift, one-handed movement, Kratos snaps Hera's neck. Kratos enters Daedalus's labyrinth, where its creator is imprisoned, forsaken by the king of the gods. Daedalus tells Kratos how to activate the labyrinth, and he finally finds Pandora. Together, they make their way back to the top of Olympus and the flame. Pandora knows her purpose and moves to sacrifice herself in the flame, but Kratos attempts to stop her, as does Zeus upon his arrival. A battle of words ensues, followed by their first battle encounter since the ascent of Olympus. Pandora awakens, and thanks to Zeus's mocking of Kratos, eventually enters the flame. Kratos opens the box, but it is empty, so with nothing more to do, he enters the final battle with Zeus in the spot that he was cast from at the start of this war. As the battle rages, Gaia returns with a regenerated hand and she attempts to kill both Zeus and Kratos. The battle moves into Gaia's heart cavity, where Kratos deals a super blow, driving the blade of Olympus through the hearts of both Zeus and Gaia finally killing the Mother Earth Titan, and seemingly killing the King of the Gods. When the dust settles, Zeus takes on a higher form, much the same as Athena, and attacks Kratos, destroying all of his weaponry and magic, barring the Blades of Exile, weapons formed from that higher existence power, and the Blade of Olympus. Zeus casts Kratos into a dream world to destroy his mind. The ghost of Sparta breaks the state, however, by finally overcoming the demons of his past and remembering Pandora's words. Hope is what makes us strong. It is why we are here. It is what we fight with when all else is lost. And Kratos finishes the higher existence Zeus with his bare hands. With all the gods of Olympus dead, Athena appears before Kratos above a ruined Greek world. Athena wants the power that she placed within the box. Hope. The same power Kratos has been using since he first opened it years ago. She wants the power to rule over humanity and be the only god. But tired of being a pawn of the Olympians, Kratos takes up the blade of Olympus and rather than cast down Athena, runs himself through, releasing hope for the whole of humanity, rather than one single god. Kratos awakens from his wounds fully healed. In a shocking moment, he realizes that he is cursed. He cannot die by his own hand, nor can he die of old age. Enraged that even now, with all of the gods dead, he cannot find peace. 
He yeets the blades of exile into the sea, but they are immediately returned to him, looking more akin to his original blades of chaos. World weary, angry, frustrated, and with nothing better to do, Kratos starts wandering the world. As he wanders, Kratos does not want to sleep. Every time that he does, the cursed blades return to his side. But if he walks and doesn't sleep, they do not return. Any injury that he gets, he heals, as if by magic, with no blemish or scar. Kratos has become a full god following his actions in Greece, and likely from reabsorbing his own godly power from the blade of Olympus. But rather than take up the mantle, he keeps walking and keeps to himself. He eventually finds himself in a foreign land, sunny, deserty, and far away from his home in Sparta. Yet still, he is known. An oracle of sorts, a seer, a man in tune with destiny, welcomes Kratos as other citizens flee the ghost of Sparta, his reputation preceding him. The seer begs Kratos to stay to fulfill his destiny, but the god of war moves onward leaving the town behind. Still not wanting to sleep, he attempts to stay awake, but as with all beings, eventually he does fall asleep. He awakens in a strange place to Athena stood before him. She tells him to return home, return to Greece and embrace his destiny. But Kratos shuns these remarks and awakens properly, right where he fell asleep. He wanders on, but somehow returns to the village where they feared him earlier, his journey wandering full circle. The citizens still show fear, though not at him. In him, they see a saviour, someone who can save them from a chaos beast. After much convincing, Kratos eventually launches an attack on the beast. The attack is brutal, and after some back and forth, screaming at the beast for making him do this, Kratos kills the Chaos Beast, though the town is pretty much destroyed. The villagers rejoice initially, but then, when approaching Kratos, start to tremble in fear once more. The prophet tells Kratos his purpose is not yet complete, as an even bigger beast rears itself from the depths of the Nile. After lamenting his torments, and the fact that the beast will not just let him walk away, Kratos attacks again. But this time, the beast doesn't flinch and makes very short work of the ghost of Sparta, batting him away and leaving Kratos unconscious. For now, this is all we know about much of the events between the God of War's time in his Greek and Norse adventures. I will return to this era when we have more information with the finishing of the Fallen God comic series. For now, we turn to a different moment, a little later, and how Kratos made it to Norway. Though later in life Kratos will state he came to these shores from another land, far away from here, his memories are a little different and more fantastical. Whether still running from the blades or exhausted from destiny constantly hounding him, Kratos fights a foe only within his mind's eye. He faced three wolves that were all twice his height. One black, one white, and one grey. Despite swinging his chained blades, the wolves are not discouraged. A hooded woman stands behind the wolves and nods, and all three attack. The black wolf rips into his thigh and drags him away. Upon normal consciousness resuming, Kratos is now in Norway. Whether he was dragged or walked, sailed or made his way to Norway via some other method is unknown due to the weird state of the ghost of Sparta's mind at that time. But he was now in a new region, and he would choose to live as a man, meet a woman that he fell in love with, marry, and have a son. While being a dutiful husband to his wife Faye, who knows of his true nature, Kratos is somewhat of an absent father. Every day he leaves the house and sanctuary created by Faye's magics and heads into the woods surrounding the house to test himself. He searches out wild animals and mythical beasts 
and provokes them to attack. His aim is not to fight, however. He aims to take the punishment that these beasts can dole out and keep his rage in check, all for the sake of his son. Day after day, he thinks he fails and that the beast of rage consumes him once more. But it takes more each time to push him to that point. And unseen to himself, the ex-god of war is growing. One day, a beast-like bear is attacking an old man, and Kratos, unwilling at first, kills the bear to save said man. But it's too late, and he dies. A group of different men follow him home and accuse him of killing their brother. These men transform into the bear-like beasts known as berserkers. Kratos fights to save his son, but the boy cannot defend himself. It is a tough fight, trying to contain his rage and protect the boy while taking the wrath of the berserkers. But Kratos succeeds, to a degree. The berserker leader survives and runs away vowing vengeance. Kratos and Atreus set off in pursuit so that he cannot bring his friends back later, but they lose the trail. With Atreus's quick thinking, they visit the local seer and can track down the remaining berserkers. The seer sends Kratos north, but warns him that he must face the berserkers as a man with cunning and wisdom and not as a monster, or he will surely lose. She also informs him that there is a cost to this knowledge. Kratos travels north and encounters the berserkers once more, having left Atreus behind. To Kratos' credit, he was trying to be stealthy and not engage before destroying their idol. However, one of the berserkers wakes, and a fight ensues. On the ropes, he must use his head and launches his axe at the totem, cutting it down and setting it alight before rage takes over and he kills the now human berserkers, losing his test once more. Returning to the seer, the leader of the berserkers has attacked. Atreus holds the man off but cannot deliver a final blow. Kratos, much as he did with Hera, snaps the man's neck one-handed. He speaks to the dying seer following the attack, who has paid the price for the knowledge, and sees to her remains before returning home with Atreus. Not long after, Faye passes away, leaving instructions to her husband and son of what to do with her remains. She wants her funeral pyre made from specific trees which she has marked with a handprint, and her ashes spread on the highest peak in all of the realms. This simple request sets in motion a series of events that will shake the Norse pantheon. Kratos and Atreus' journey starts before they've left home, as once they burn the funeral pyre, they get a knock on their door as the home is no longer protected. The stranger tries to entice Kratos into a fight in a case of mistaken identity, and Kratos holds strong, not engaging in battle until there is little other choice. The stranger is Balder, a Norse god blessed or cursed by his mother to not feel anything and be undying. Kratos fights with everything to protect his son but still holding back to prevent collateral damage, eventually snapping Baldur's neck and throwing him into a chasm. Though unbeknownst to Kratos, Baldur will return. The pair head off towards the highest peak they can see, encountering many Draugr upon the way. They also encounter trolls, magical boars, a couple of dwarves called Sindri and Brock, who augment Kratos' new Leviathan axe. Freya, the head god of the Vanir, and Jormungandr, the World Serpent. All bar the Trolls and Draugr help Faye's men on their quest, pointing them in the right direction to overcome obstacles in their path and offering upgrades and abilities to make their journey easier. The journey, however, does involve much danger, taking the pair to Alfheim to obtain the light that allows them to advance through the darkness up the mountain. They step into a war between the light and dark elves and even end up killing the dark elf king. Returning to Midgard in possession of the light, they make it to the top of the tallest mountain, where they overhear Thor's sons, Magni and Modi, speaking to someone all-knowing, along with Balder, alive and kicking once again. The knowledgeable man cannot help the three, and the Aesir gods leave. The man is stuck in a tree and is called Mimir. He tells Kratos and Atreus they are at the wrong peak, 
They need to visit Jotunheim to fulfill their promise to Fey. He offers to help, but to do this, Mimir asks Kratos to cut off his head. First, you need to cut off my head. Wait, what? Odin made sure that no weapon, not even Thor's hammer, could free my body from these bonds. But fortunately, you don't need my body. The trick is, we need to find someone who can reanimate my head using the old magic. Old magic? Mm. There's a witch of the woods. She knows the old ways. And she'll help. She might do worth a try. But if she fails, he will be dead. He tortures me, you know. Every day, brother. Odin himself sees to it personally, and believe me, there is no end to his creativity. Every single day. This... This isn't living. Very well. Oh, I can't watch this. Brother. In case you can't resurrect me, there's something you need to know. Boy. The longer you wait to tell him his true nature, the more damage you do. He will resent you, and you may lose him forever. There is much about me I would not have him know. So you value your privacy more than your son? I'm going to cut off your head now. Fair enough. Heading back down the mountain to Freya's home, Mimir is revived as a talking head and joins Kratos and Atreus on their journey, dangling from Kratos' waist, much as Helios once did. Kratos learns Freya is a god and immediately distrusts her, though she puts him in his place as he has been hiding his godhood from his son. Both Freya and Mimir tell Kratos that he must reveal Atreus' true nature to him before it is too late. The now trio set off to collect artifacts to allow them to travel to Jotunheim, and soon after encounter Magni and Modi face to face. Eager to prove themselves, the two gods engage in battle with Kratos and Atreus, seemingly unaware of the opponent they face. The God Slayer has to emerge once more to be able to take on the two Aesir simultaneously, and Kratos kills Magni. He turns immediately to Modi and simply walks towards him. Terrified, Modi flees. Advancing a little further, Modi ambushes them and holds Kratos down with lightning power similar to that of his father Thor. Atreus, angered at the Aesir at accesses his own Spartan rage, but due to him not knowing he's a god and accessing a god's power, his body and mind start to shut down. Kratos then unleashes his own rage, overpowering Modi's lightning, disarming him, and once again scaring the Aesir off. Panicked and scared for his son's safety, Kratos carries Atreus to Freya, despite his resentment of all gods. He has seen her work and hopes that she can help Atreus. Freya agrees, but needs a specific ingredient that is only found in Helheim. But the Leviathan Axe will be useless in the land of the dead. Even standard fire will not work. So Kratos must return home to collect a curse from his past. There's nowhere you can hide, Spartan. Put as much distance between you and the truth as you want. It changes nothing. Pretend to be everything you are not. Teacher. Husband. Father. 
But there is one unavoidable truth you will never escape. <laughs> you cannot change. You will always be a monster. I know. But I am your monster no longer. Reunited with the chained blades formed from a power higher than gods and calling them the Blades of Chaos once more, Kratos steps into a new hell realm and rips the heart from the keeper of the Bridge of the Damned. But Kratos is haunted once more by visions of his past, and Zeus appears to him. Mimir questions the taunting vision Kratos has been subject to, and Kratos reveals that Zeus was his father. Circa 1500 years later, and still his past in Greece haunts him. Mimir puts the pieces together and says, Your father was Zeus? I finally understand! I'm dangling from the hip of the bloody ghost of Sparta! Do not call me that. Oh, don't mistake me, brother. From what I heard, the Pantheon had it coming. It's still a bit to take in. I knew you hate gods, but you really can't stay away from them, can you? You must say nothing to the boy. He must never know. Bollocks, brother. Respectfully, bollocks. He has to know. He'll never be whole without the truth. Rushing back to Freya, the boy is cured, and Kratos finally reveals some of his true nature to Atreus. The truth. I am a god boy from another land far from here. When I came to these shores, I chose to live as a man. But the truth is, I was born a god, and so were you. Boy, have you nothing to say? Um, can I turn into an animal? Can you turn into an animal? No. No, I do not think so. I'm a god. Mother knew? She was a god too? No. She was mortal, but she knew my true nature. I'm a god. Why did you wait so long to tell me? I had hoped to spare you. Being a god, it can be a lifetime of anguish and tragedy. That is the curse. Continuing to gather the items they need to access Jotunheim, Atreus becomes increasingly arrogant until he comes across a bloody and beaten Modi. Punishment from his father Thor for letting Magni die. In cold blood, Atreus kills Modi, and Kratos scolds his son's actions. Nobody cared about him anyways. What's the difference? There are consequences to killing a god! Why? How do you know? How do you know? Watch your tone, boy. Having finally collected everything they need to activate the portal, the trio return to Midgard's Peak and activate the gate to Jotunheim. At this point, Baldur has managed to track them down and attacks, beating Kratos and stabbing Atreus in the shoulder with his own blade. Kratos lets his rage take over to stop Baldur and protect Atreus. An altercation at the Realm Gate sucks all four of them into Helheim, where after eventually reuniting, Kratos reams out Atreus, snapping him back to his senses. They traverse Hell once more to be able to leave, and on the way come across Baldur being haunted by the curse that Freya placed upon him, learning of the familial link between the unfeeling god and the head of the Vanir. Mimir, wise and knowing as ever, knows of one more possible route to Jotunheim, but they'll need to retrieve his other eye first, which, thanks to his actions earlier at eating Thor's statue, 
now resides in Jormungandr's belly. Disturbed, the trio row down the snake's throat and locate the eye, putting it back in Mimir's head. At this point, Boulder attacks Jormungandr, and Kratos, Atreus, and Mimir are rather unceremoniously thrown up. Freya arrives, Boulder walks out of the water, and a mighty three-way battle ensues. Boulder versus Kratos and Atreus in his quest to feel something. Boulder versus his mother in vengeance for the curse placed upon him. And Freya, in control of the dead giant's body, versus Kratos and Atreus to stop them killing her son. The battle ends when the giant is brought down and Boulder is made vulnerable again when he punches Atreus' quiver strap held together by mistletoe, undoing Freya's spell. Given the option to retreat by Kratos, Boulder ignores it and moves to kill his mother Freya despite Kratos' warning. Freya holds so much love for her child that she is willing to let this happen to give him peace. But Kratos steps in. <laughs> Distraught, Freya swears vengeance on Kratos and scolds him once more for not letting Atreus know everything. Kratos finally reveals his bloody path to this point, only omitting the murder of his first family, Lysander and Calliope. With Mimir opting to stay behind, the father and son duo finally make it to the highest peak in all of the realms, where even there, they find Faye's handprint and ledge painting as seen on all of the trees and obvious ledges throughout their journey. Faye has been leading them, every step of the way. Atop the mountain, they uncover a mural that shows how Faye knew where they would be and what would happen. But it also depicted two other events. Atreus bringing around Ragnarok, and the death of Kratos in his son's arms. The duo move on and scatter Faye's ashes after revealing that all giants are dead and that Faye was one of them, making Atreus half giant and half god. And we learn that his mother wanted to call him Loki. As they return to Midgard, Fimble Winter has begun. This is the precursor to Ragnarok. The father, son and Mimir trio, knowing they can weather what Ragnarok throws at them, return home and sleep, where Atreus has a vision. Atreus, are you ready? Yeah, but I had the weirdest dream. Fimble Winter was ending, and Thor came for us, here at the house. It was only a dream. But it felt different. It felt real. It felt like... the future. Then we will worry about it tomorrow. And that is everything that we have so far. The follow-up to the original Norse adventure is due in 2021, and who knows, maybe we'll be able to fill in more of the blanks. But for now, that is the entire story of Kratos up to this point. If there's anything you think I've missed, please let me know down in the comments below. But otherwise, I would like to thank you all very much for tuning in. My name is Doragon, this 
is a brief history of God of War, nearing a full hour now, but hey-ho. And until next time, guys, have yourselves a fantastic day, and take care.